started. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please ask them in that Q&A box. Uh, that's the one with a question mark inside a white box, and that way we can see, everyone can see the question and answers. And I'll try to answer them while Corey is presenting. And if he is, uh, or, or if he, if it's a question I can't answer, I will ask Corey, and he'll also have some time at the end for Q&A as well. So go ahead, Corey. Excellent, Dana. Can you hear me all right? Perfectly. Great. And uh, can you see my desktop? Yes, I see your Gmail screen. Excellent. Well, well, we'll jump over there soon enough. Well, hello, everybody. I'm sure glad you could make it this afternoon. I'm going to be bouncing around my office. I was actually considering standing up while I did this because I don't exactly uh, know how this should feel without a room full of people to look at and point at. So um, just imagine a uh, half-balding 30-year-old guy jumping around pointing at his computer right now. What I have up here for you to see, well, let me give you a little background. So uh, what I do now, my day job, I work with the University of Colorado at Boulder in the School of Education. My title is Academic Technology Consultant. But what that means is I work directly with faculty and with the teacher training program, uh, supporting them in finding ways to integrate technology into their own teaching. So sometimes that means I'm doing workshops like these, sometimes I'm consulting at a programmatic level, and honestly, sometimes I'm helping people check their email. Uh, so I get to wear a, a, a lot of hats, but uh, before I came here, how did I get here? Well, I used to work at a place called the Watershed School, a small nonprofit private school in Boulder, Colorado, that has the distinction of being the first K through 12 Google Apps case study school. Back in 2007, we jumped on the bandwagon, and we took our little school that uh, it was against the rules for students to send email to their teachers, and within a year, we became an, uh, a near paperless school, where to this day, the students still maintain online digital portfolios that, uh, that are used as an assessment tool uh, throughout their 6th through 12th grade years at the school. So that's what got me here. Uh, I've taught before at three of the Google Certified Teacher events, one here in my hometown of Boulder, Colorado, as well as in Seattle and in San Antonio. And I do, do a regular uh, consulting business on the side, working with school districts and individual schools, learning how to use Google Apps in the classroom. So that's what gets us here today. Uh, let me give you an idea of what I hope to do here today. What you see on your screen right now is my outline. This is part of what I call my educator Lent. I've decided to give up presentations for a while. Uh, I do have a presentation. I gave this presentation at the Seattle Google Teacher Academy. I have that presentation. But I'm working on giving people as many demos as possible and actually let them see what I do and what other people do in action. Uh, rather than bullet-pointed lists. So uh, bullets are for guns, and PowerPoint doesn't kill people, bullet points do. So that brings us here today. This is crazy. I don't know. I'm laughing at my own jokes. I don't even know if I'm funny or not. Uh, you, you, some lols in the uh, in the chat box is okay, just so you guys know. I lolled, Corey. I lolled. I, I appreciate it, Dana. Excellent. So I love Gmail. Uh, Gmail is really what brought me into the Google world. I always discuss it as the, the core app. It really is the center of what makes all of these things work. And it's one of my favorite things to teach. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be here today with it uh, because I think people really need this. Uh, what, I, what I've found in the past is that the, the relationship that people have with their email address is not rational. Um, it's emotional. Uh, people, people don't feel, uh, feel, you know, no, let me put it this way. People feel dread when they see their inboxes. They see enormous counts. They, they find ways to avoid even looking at their computer screen. They get addicted to little notifications that pop up on their screen. And what ends up happening is you don't actually get work done. You're just abused by your email account. And Gmail really offers you some tools that empower you to be able to really beat that feeling, to get on top of your work, get on top of your email, and ultimately manage your life. 
Now, I will tell you right now that uh, this is not a, a magic trick. Uh, you can't just start using Gmail and then suddenly everything works and uh, your boss, uh, everything gets accomplished on time, you feel no stress, and your boss quits emailing you at 2 a.m. All of those things are still going to happen. And I will tell you that you are going to fall off the ban uh, you're going to fall off the wagon using these tools. You're going to commit to inbox zero, and then you're going to wake up one day and see 500 emails in your inbox, and it's going to be tough, but that's that emotional experience that I talk about. But you have to think of it as a martial art. It's a, uh, it's a way in which you think about the art of your work, and that's where we're going to get started here. I want to, I want to talk to you about this idea of, of work as a martial art, which isn't at all my idea. Uh, it came from a guy by the name of David Allen, Getting Things Done. And I linked to a video in the outline and also what you can see on my screen here uh, when he presented at the Googleplex. And he will really talk about developing the discipline around making decisions on your work and not putting things off and, uh, and actually getting on top of your life. So I encourage you to think about those. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and talk about that in the context of Gmail. And to do that, I'm going to do something that's terrifying to me. Um, I'm going to publicly share my email account with strangers in the world. Uh, I, I click over here, and I might as well be showering in public right now because you're seeing the world as, as I see it for most of my day. Uh, email comes in, I deal with it, I process it. I also reserve the right at any point during this webinar to click off because I actually, you never know what's going to come into your inbox. Uh, but I want you to see that this is the, this is the world that I live in. This is, this is my life. And I want, I want to have you notice on the right hand side of my screen that there really aren't any emails older than about a day. And the reality is, is that I've gone to great lengths to, uh, to, to not get into those emails today because my instinct is to go after what is called inbox zero. Inbox zero is the idea that at least every few days, if not every day, you want to get your inbox to zero. And that is what Gmail is designed to help you do. It's not designed to live your life like in a, in a stream, like a, a Twitter stream where things are coming in and you react to them and then they pass through your inbox and you miss them. But rather, your inbox is somewhere where things come in to be processed. And the evidence that I offer for this is the birth of Gmail. Uh, not, not everyone remembers that in the very early days of Gmail, you, you couldn't delete emails. There was no delete button. It, it drove people nuts because they went in and they thought they had to get rid of an email and they wanted to delete it. But the reality was is the, the engineers and designers wanted you to archive email. They wanted you to process, make a decision about, and then archive your email so that you can have access to it later, but so that it didn't just serve as this overwhelming burden in your life, this thing that you saw in your inbox every single day. And they, they tried to compress it to where it was nice and clean. You have conversations that are threaded. And, and this space that really is designed, and notice especially with the redesign of Gmail, it's meant to be spacious so you can be thoughtful about what's on your screen, process it, and get past it. And I wanted to show you, uh, this is my work email account, which appears both in a Gmail window, and now I want to show you what that looks like in a traditional Outlook world. Okay, so here is this long line of emails that are all of those emails that you saw there uh, in a line, no priority, no threading, cramped in a tiny little col uh, column, and, and really very unmanageable. Now let's jump back and compare these exact same emails as organized by Gmail. So we jump over here. Notice how many fewer they, uh, there are. Uh, notice how they're organized around the ones that I know that are important, and these are ones that I've tagged to follow up on later, as well as an automatic filter that has told me everything else down here is probably not as important and doesn't need my attention right now. I could go through really quickly.
quickly. I would say it would take me about 10 minutes to get through this inbox and, and be done with it and get to move on with my life. I want to show you, first of all, how to get your inbox to organize like this. Many of you out there have probably already used Priority Inbox, but for those people that may have seen it pop up in the left-hand corner that maybe you should try it and you've turned it off, I want to let you know where you can go to turn that back on and how to customize it. Because some of you may notice my Priority Inbox doesn't look like the default Priority Inbox for Gmail. So in your Gmail account, you can go up to your gear, your settings, and you can go into Settings. And one of the options that's now available to you is your inbox, where you can change whether it's an inbox, a priority inbox, and, how, and some different um, uh, basic feeds on how it can be organized. Right below that in the inbox, you have the ability to, to change the number of inboxes what order they appear in. This is the one that really fits my workflow best, pushing my important and unread things to the top, the things that I flagged for immediate feedback right right there next, important messages, which I, I allow myself maybe a few hours or a, up to a day to let them ferment, and then an everything else section. This is my favorite configuration, but you can get in here and you can, uh, and you can adjust it to how you want to get your work done. Also notice at the bottom of this, we're going to talk a little bit more about filters in a while, but you have the ability to override filters by Priority Inbox. Priority Inbox is using algorithms that react to who you most regularly email with, if the email was sent directly to you, keywords, lots of information that can be culled from your account to decide what is important. And sometimes your intentional filters that you have set up to move emails directly out of your inbox might skip something that you really should see. This is where you go in to tell Gmail, hey, if you think that, you, uh, that this is important enough that it shouldn't skip my inbox, go ahead, mark it as important, and put it into my inbox. So looking at Priority Inbox, this is how you organize it, and this is how you set it up to override what we're going to cover later in filters. Let's go back to my inbox. We now have this, autom uh, this semi-automated system doing the first level of organization. But then we need to get to the point where we talk about inbox zero. So inbox zero isn't about responding to every email as it comes in. Actually, that's the thing that will drive you insane. If you, if you immediately respond to every email that comes into your inbox, not only will you never be able to concentrate on anything, but at the same time, you'll be creating more email. Because every time you send an email, half the time someone's going to send you something back. So you really want to be able to chunk that and make good decisions about how you're doing your work. Google has a built-in feature called Tasks that's going to, uh, that, that will support you in, in turning your emails not into something that's done being dealt with, but a task that you can think about, organize, and plan for later. So the trick when getting to inbox zero is processing your email into chunks that you decide when you're going to deal with. It really is about making decisions. And for those people that think that I'm crazy, the, thing, the experience that I ask you to think about right now, looking at your own email, looking at your in, uh, own inbox, Notice how many of your emails are in there, read, sitting in there simply to remind you to do something later. The problem is, an inbox is a feed, and it will quickly happen that things that you've marked to follow up with later will become more than, say, the 50 emails that are limited in what you can see on your screen, and you'll forget about it, and you'll drop your work. So we're going to process our emails into tasks. To be able to access tasks, you can go up here to the mail dropdown, and you'll see that there's a tasks option. So if I click tasks, it will pop up in the right-hand corner of my screen. I will tell you right now, these are not really my tasks. Before there were tasks, there was a thing called Remember the Milk. It's another service. It's not a Google service. I love it. I live out of it. Um, 
and I've heard rumors that someday Google will be uh, developing its task software into being something a little bit more robust. But it's a really good entry point for somebody who wants to start practicing processing their email. I can go in right here and I can create tasks by clicking plus and saying remember the milk as a task that I have to follow up on. And I can edit the attributes of that ta uh, task by clicking this arrow while I'm focused on it. No. Okay. I may need to reload here. The the reboot there's a reboot of the uh of the Google world. Simple refresh. Corey, while you're waiting, can you just show again how you got to the task list, how, where, which uh, area of the screen you have to mouse over or click? So for those people that might have missed it, up here in the left-hand corner, I have my giant mouse turned on. Under the mail, there's a drop-down list that will also take you to your contacts and your tasks, which open up over here. And I'm not right now having success, and I don't know why it's not clicking me into the tasks. So let's go ahead and skip through my favorite way to actually make a task in here, which is that, you, is that I can go into an email and I can say, hey, uh, Mary Ann Shea wants me to send her information on my trainings. I go into the email. Under the more actions list is the ability to add this email to the tasks. Your conversation has been added to tasks. We have the subject line here. Uh, Again, I don't know what's going on that's stopping me from being able to access it because when I can access this and try it on your end, you can set the due date of the task and that's connected to your Google Calendar so that it comes up there. And notice there's this great related email link. And if I click on the related email, and it doesn't matter if I'm in the inbox, and I click on related email, it takes me to the email in which I created this task. So this allows you to be able to let go of that email get it out of your inbox, and still know it's going to be in a place that you're going to take care of it. But a task list will quickly overwhelm you. Your task list, if you just simply add things and add things and add things, will turn into the same stream that we're trying to avoid by archiving your email. And to deal with that, you create lists. So down here, there's a uh, list option. Notice I have Corey's list. I could add a new list and call my list groceries. Click OK. And I now have a groceries. There's, of course, no tasks there. I'm going to go back to Corey's list. I'm going to click Remember the Milk. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, I think I have to be able to do it from within the task. If you click the arrow, I know I'm clicking the arrow. It's not letting me in. Somebody's also giving me the advice. It might be something having to do with the way that, uh, that I have WebEx going. So you're just going to have to trust me that from within the task, I have the ability to edit the, uh, edit the due date as well as move it around those lists so you can associate emails with projects and you can, uh, you can more adeptly manage your work rather than simply having an overwhelming inbox here. All right. So, what I've shown you so far is the idea of setting up a priority inbox and the concept of, uh, of archiving rather than deleting your email, which might be worth uh, uh, on the headline bar black to expand. That'll take me out, and then will it let me in the task? Somebody was suggesting that I do this. No, it's not going to let me uh, into the tasks, although it did just about a half hour ago when I tried this out. No, Corey, it looks like when you when you uh, mouse over to that right arrow, uh, occasionally it turns into the, the white pointy hand. Yeah. It's like very small. Oh, there you go. It did it. Fantastic. Well, Outlook's invitations. See, now we can do the due date. 
Uh, the answer for those people that are wondering, it's not uh, what, what Dana was pointing out there. It's not that the uh, task list wasn't working. It's that I'm using this program that creates a giant mouse uh, which hopefully makes it easier for you to follow what I'm doing on my screen, made it harder for me to hit the uh, error, arrow to expand those tasks. But also notice that I have the ability to now add this to a grocery list and back to the list. So there we go. That's task for you. Thanks for catching that one, Dana. All right. So back to our inbox here. Uh, I did, uh, did skip over a little bit that I wanted to tell you more about archiving versus deleting because what ends up happening is I get two questions. How do you find those things? And the first question is one of anxiety, that is it really still there? A lot of people have never noticed that one of the labels that you have over here is all mail. And if I click all mail, I go ahead and get a full list of every email that I've sent or that has come in and out of my, uh, my account. Uh, so you can always go back and manually see your inbox as a feed if you need the satisfaction of knowing it's there. On the other hand, the best way to find something is to search for it. And we now have this search bar up here, and I can search for, say, Dana. And there's also these advanced search options. So I can search labels, I can search based on a from line, a to line, I can exclude certain pieces of information, and I can grab emails within a date of a certain time, which you don't even have to put anything in the search bar, you can leave it blank and search for emails within a certain date range, which has saved me more times than I can count when I can't remember the keyword that I'm looking for, but I do remember what week of the year I was having that email conversation in. So the power is archive your emails, archive everything. You have a near limitless supply of space within your, uh, within your Gmail account. Use it. Get those emails uh, thought about, put on your task list, archive, access them based as attributes on your task, or just search for them. That's the power of, uh, of using a Google system, is there's always excellent search tools that are available to you to find what you're looking for. Okay, I'm gonna take, a, take just a breath there and I'm gonna look over at the chat screen. And if you, uh, if you have any questions about the things that we just looked at, go ahead and uh, throw a question in there. As I take a deep breath and move down my, uh, my notes. So I'm looking for that, and in the meantime, I am going to show you another nifty trick that you have with those tasks. Because a lot of times you don't want to manage your tasks while you're looking at your email, because if you do, your, uh, your email will serve as a distraction while you're thinking about your tasks. I've included in our webinar outline this link, a link that when opened will show you your tasks as an independent window. This is it's one of those little-known backdoor uh, features of, of the Google Apps system. But from within here, I can really think about my tasks without having the co a constant ding of new emails coming into my account every few minutes. Okay. Can you tell us, I'm having a question about uh, date range, uh, about archiving and searching for emails. And they're specifically asking me, how do you do this date range search? Well, it really is. I can say within one week of March 12th, 2010, uh, and no mes messages happened in there. But notice how it converted it up here into a specific search. Uh, 2000, after 2005, let me see if I can get something within one week of uh, yesterday. And there we go. Uh, it brought me up all of the emails that happened. And notice it was a, it was a smart search field. It knew that yesterday was actually a certain date range and it went one be a week back from yesterday and converted it and made the search effective. So hopefully that helps you with that particu particular uh, answer. Go ahead and play with it a little bit and enjoy finding your email from the past. I also included in that webinar outline links to all of the mobile versions of tasks. Uh, 
I don't know, and Dana, I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, if you know of any uh, in-house solutions that are that are mobile apps, but I'm pretty sure they're all web apps available for these platforms. Yeah, I believe that there is a mobile website optimized version of tasks, of Google Tasks. If you just go to your mobile Gmail inbox, just, you know, gmail.com on a mobile phone, you can then click on tasks, and it is mobile friendly. Uh, what I've done is I've created, I've bookmarked it, and then created a bookmark kind of uh, link on my home screen, on my Android phone, and I also did it when I had an iPhone, just kind of had a, a bookmark link there. So it's not exactly an app, but it takes you right to the web page. Great, and and I also have all of those linked on the uh, on the webinar outline uh, right here, so that you can go directly to them. Uh, I I hope that those are ac yes those try those. I didn't have all of those devices, so I didn't get to test those links, but I found a pretty reliable reference online that suggested those. And of course, Dana is about as reliable as it gets for uh, for for this information in this uh, environment. So go ahead and access it from that mobile platform. Okay, and somebody also just asked me the difference between archive and back arrow. Back arrow just takes you back to the previous screen that you've seen. So if I click in this email, it takes me back into the last, that search screen that I had. Uh, however, you can, it, you can uh, so, but it doesn't take it out of your inbox. The message is still there. Archiving is what you have to do to get the message to actually be removed from your inbox. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and start talking about some of the even more powerful features that are available to you for managing your, uh, your email, especially around the idea of organization. So uh, when you get migrated into your first Gmail account, you're almost always coming from an environment where you are using folders to organize your email. It might have looked something like this, and in here, I have a bunch of emails as they would look inside of an Outlook system. The problem is, is that I can only put each of these emails into a single folder. In the Gmail ecosystem, any email can be labeled as many ways as you'd like. That's why they're called labels, not, uh, not folders. You have the ability to organize and edit those folders. And notice, I, I keep using this more and less. Uh, to see all of them. It does automatically prioritize the labels you're using more often, or you can just grab them and move them around. And move them around. Well, maybe not. Uh, the reorganization then will happen in the Manage Labels. I've scrolled all the way down. You can also access this by going up to the Settings in the right-hand corner of your inbox. But I'm going to go ahead and go into that Manage Labels. It's going to take you into the back end, and what you're going to actually see is I have lots and lots of, well, I guess I don't, this is a second email account uh, that I use, uh, quite a few still labels, but notice there a show, a hide, and a show if unread. I, uh, let's say I, for instance, want to, and I've been saving these emails for a week so that I can demo these, uh, these for you. I've been getting these help desk emails at my current position. These, uh, they aren't very useful. They're from an automated system. They just started a few weeks ago. Let's say that I'm going to go in and I look at this email and I'm tired of archiving these every single morning. There's no information coming in them. I might need that sometime in the future. What I can do is I can automatically filter these. Check this out. I'm in the email by going to filter messages like these. That was under the more filter messages like these. It guesses what I mean. It's from helpdesk at ucourses.com. Well, yes, actually, I do want everything that comes from that email address to skip the inbox. And let's go ahead and uh, apply a label so that you can see that I can do two actions. Choose a label, new label, help desk, and there's this powerful feature to nest labels underneath other labels. So, you'll notice that I have an iTunes View, iTunes View Reports. I have these archived labels that I'm about to talk about and labels that occur underneath that. But I want Help Desk to be a top level label, so I'm going to go ahead and create that label. Okay, label was created. 
there are other options. I encourage you to, uh, to look, uh, look through these. I could reply with canned responses, which we'll talk about later. But I also want it to apply to all messages that have already come in. I'm going to create that filter. And now if I go back to my inbox, you'll see all of those messages are gone. And if I come back over here, there's Help Desk. There are 433 emails inside of Help Desk. It's bolded because they're unread 433. Now, what I, uh, why I did that is I wanted to show you within Manage Labels, the ability, you can show the label, which means it shows up on the left-hand side, hide the label to where it exists but doesn't clutter up your inbox, or only show up if the emails inside the inbox are unread. So, you do still get a notification that those emails are coming in, but only as a bulk notification for all of the emails that fall within that, la uh, that label classification. I would do that by going here to Help Desk. And I would say, show if unread. And now I can go into Help Desk, check and say, no, it's all the standard things. I'm going to select all of those emails. And notice it only selected the 50 that are on my screen. I'm going to select all 440 conversations in Help Desk. And I'm going to mark them all as red. Yes. And Help Desk is now gone. Tomorrow morning when I wake up and I've gotten a new batch in the middle of the night, Help Desk is going to return as a label in the left-hand side of my screen. So that's automatic labeling. Uh, I also want to call attention to your ability to come over here and change the colors of labels. You notice they're color-coded. And if I go into uh, these, well, you're not going to see it here. I actually don't have any. Uh, if, they, if they come into my inbox, as they're labeled, you're going to see the color classification of those labels as I do it. For instance, I can take this email and I can label it uh, Google Training Interest, which is what it is, and I get an orange label. So if I had just set up my filter to, say, uh, look for the words presentations, label them as training interest, I would get a nice orange tag that would call attention to those emails as they came into my inbox. This is also a good place to, uh, to remind you of the priority inbox override, because remember, I said take all of those in emails that come in from the help desk and archive them. Get them immediately out of my inbox and show it on the left-hand side of my screen. However, I could suddenly get a very different email from that same service that was sent just to me with a different subject line, and there's a good chance that if I had set it to override priority inbox, it's going to get marked as important, and it's going to show up in my, uh, in my inbox that next morning. That's your warning, but I really encourage you to be thoughtful and automate what, uh, your email handling as much as possible, and this also allows you to chunk your email. One of my favorites is using forums. I don't really use a lot of forums in this email account, uh, but if I go to my personal non-work email account where I keep forums, I have access to all kinds of forums, and I can only read them on my own time instead of constantly being bombarded by notifications from these groups that, there, uh, that, that there's more messages to be read, I just get the one notification on the left-hand side of my screen that tells me, hey, it's time to check out your, um, your group memberships. Maybe I do that on a Friday afternoon. And more importantly, it doesn't give me that feeling of, oh, I have so many emails today. Uh, I did just get a question uh, because um, it's, it's, I'm, doing, I'm doing something that's a, a little non-traditional, which is uh, using Outlook and Gmail at the same time. And somebody's asking if you're in an Outlook environment, can you do that? If your company doesn't allow you to set up forwarding inside of your, uh, inside of your Exchange server, no, you can't. What I do is I have a computer that syncs my two accounts. The reason being is that I use Gmail to get through my email fast. That's why I'm, I'm doing this webinar right now, and I can't move that fast in Outlook. It's not designed to move through email quickly. Well, this is designed to get me to that inbox zero. 
So the bad news is probably not uh, unless you get creative. There, a, I have set up a rule in Outlook. I have my Gmail account synced into an Outlook account, and it's basically syncing the two accounts. But there's no standard way to do this. The best way is to work with your company to get on to Google Apps for Businesses uh, or Google Apps for Education, where everyone in the company can benefit from this. Or if they still choose, they are allowed to use Outlook. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in that plug. I don't work for Google, but uh, I have convinced more than one organization that they really should get out of the Outlook world. Uh, okay, so moving along. We've looked at creating and managing and navigating your labels and setting up automatic filters. I want to talk to you about keyboard shortcuts. So I mentioned at the beginning that this is, a, this is an issue of a martial art, and martial arts require practice. They require muscle memory, and those are all things that happen with keyboard shortcuts. Forgive me if this seems a little hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic but... Um, you have to practice your keyboard shortcuts. But once you do, and this is so much better when it's not a webinar and you can see me move, because what I do is I, I put my hands on my keyboard, and if you'll notice, there's a, there's a focus on the left-hand side of the inbox, and I use the J and K letters, and I can arrow through, and I can hit enter to go into an email, and I can use the key combination G and I to go back into the inbox. I can mark uh, an email say some of these down here by clicking X and I'm doing KX, KX to, do, uh, to go through these emails and then without having to move my mouse I can push the E key and it archives all of those emails. If this isn't working on your computer right now in your own Gmail account you probably don't have keyboard shortcuts turned on. To do that you go into your settings again oh, I have to move the presenter tool, okay, and I go into my settings. Notice, in the first tab, this is the third area that they have put in their menus. This really is designed as the primary way you should be accessing your email, uh, email account, using these keyboard shortcuts. Go ahead and turn them on, and then start practicing. You may find yourself in the inbox going, oh, I can't remember how to, uh, how, how to go back to my inbox. How, what is the key to do archive? Well, what you do is you just ask Gmail with the question mark. I just press the question mark, which is a shift question mark on the Mac, and it brings up all of the keyboard shortcuts. When I do Gmail interventions uh, for my family and friends and Occasionally, my coworkers, I take my five or six favorite of these keyboard shortcuts that you see right here. I type them out on a nice little piece of paper, and I tape them right to the top of their keyboard. And then I say, use them. You're going to have to push yourself. You're going to have to try. Uh, you're you're going to have to think about this for a few days. But eventually, you're going to be able to move through your uh, inbox many times faster than you do moving around your moving around with your mouse. So. And I'd say, Corey, that my favorite keyboard shortcut actually are these square brackets. And if you pull up that, um, pull up the question mark again. Uh, mm -hmm. So Corey's been talking a lot about archiving and, you know, inbox zero. And what the square brackets do is that they um, archive and, or sorry, is it curly brackets? I can't remember which one it is. But curly or square brackets, they archive the conversation and move to the next one. So you don't have to hit archive and then go and open up a new message, and it lets you really cycle through all of your email messages in your inbox very quickly. That's my fave. Do you have a favorite shortcut, Corey? Um, I, I spend all day doing J-K-X-E. Uh, so for those people, what that means is J and K move through the list, uh, the list of emails, uh, J and K going up and down. Uh, and, of course, my chat window is open because I need to have all this stuff available. Okay, so I go up and down and X, and then, well, I don't want to do it on the important unread emails. But down here, I get my cursor focus, X, E, X, E, X, 
see. It is, it is a cathartic experience. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling to be able to go to your everything else section of your inbox, things that you generally don't e -A use anyway, and go X, E, X, E. It's, it's a rhythm. It's very healthy. Uh, and it's my favorite keyboard shortcut. Okay. So on the, uh, the webinar outline, I gave you guys my favorites uh, right here. Those don't include the one that Dana just showed you, but you can get by clicking the question or typing a question mark when you're in the Gmail interface. Uh, for those people who may have not come in or saw this, I also have this whole document available at this tiny URL right here, tiny URL, Gmail Jedi, which I'll send back out to the whole group. So that you can go ahead and reaccess any of this information or some of these links that I've provided to you. But now as we start getting near the end of this time, we have to get into the really cool stuff. The stuff that really is the, uh, the Jedi portion, the advanced section of Gmail, which is the things that happen inside of labs. Now, the, the full disclosure warning is labs are, are where the engineers are experimenting with new ideas within Gmail. So you never know if your favorite lab is going to go away. But I actually don't think I've had any of my favorite labs go away. Usually what happens is they get graduated into the full Gmail service, and you, have the, uh, you then get to use them without having to turn them on. So before I show you a few of my favorite labs, I'm going to show you where you access those labs. Again, we keep going to the gear, the settings menu, and we go to settings. And now, up here, one of these options is labs. Okay. Uh, I don't remember, uh, do you still have to turn on labs the first time you go on, uh, Dana? And I should also probably mention that for, uh, for some people, these might not be available in the Google Apps domains. Is that also correct? Uh, yes, so uh, your administrator, if you're using Google Apps for Education, will have to enable labs to be available. Um, I don't, I think the first time around, if you just open the labs tab, it, it, it enables it. But if you're using Google Apps for Education and you're not seeing that labs tab, contact your domain administrator about that. And there's a question here about an archive. Yes, this uh, webinar is being recorded and we will uh, upload it to YouTube and send you the link later this week or early next week, so you can watch it and share it around and have your own Gmail interventions if you want later on. Excellent. Thanks, Dana. So, let's, so you come in to the settings, and you go to the Labs tab, and now you can scroll through and peruse and see what your favorite, uh, favorite labs are. Enable them. Go ahead and save it when you're done. And then they'll be available. So let me show you uh, uh, one, of, one of my favorites that's in here. Uh, canned responses. So I've turned on canned responses. That's the second one in the list here. And you can go and you can create an e email, uh, make it a blank email. This is a canned response. And under canned responses, I can save a new canned response. But really what I'd like to show you is two of my favorites that I like to use, that I've created. Uh, and you can really get creative with this. You could have a full confirmation. If you were running a help desk, you could have a filter set up that whenever an email came in to a certain email address that's forwarded, a help at your domain, uh, that email would be labeled as a help at your domain, and a canned response would be replied that said, thank you for your inquiry. We will get back to you within 24 hours. I often get asked in my organization for the smart key, um, which I probably shouldn't click right here because this is going to be a publicly available, uh, uh, available video. Uh, but what I can show you is my calendar link. What I do is I click that, and it's a, it's a single URL that if I click on this for somebody, it takes me to a Google Calendar that I have embedded inside of a Google site and this is a free busy time. Let me show you what it looks like for uh, people who, uh, who aren't me. It's a link to my public Google Calendar with my free busy time. And for people who aren't within my domain, who aren't regularly uh, able to access my calendar, I can say, hey, I would love to get together sometime this week. Take a look at my public calendar, which I would insert as a, as a canned response. And they can click on it, and they have full access to now view what's available 
on my schedule. It's like two weeks out. Good if you want to get together. Any other canned responses you can think of that, that we should mention there, Dana? I know that's one of your favorites. Um, are we talking about labs or just canned responses in general? We're going to jump back into labs here in just a second. Any other? Uh, did, you, did you showcase the ability to use canned responses as part of your filters? That's one of the things that I like. So um, I know some people are asking, can you merge your Gmail accounts and if, if you have forwarding? So let's say that you maybe are part of a Google group and everything that comes to your help desk or comes to some kind of email account that's feeding into your normal inbox, you can set up a filter um, using the same technology or the same um, uh, kind of clicking that right down arrow in the search box that Corey has. And when you set it up, say it's saying to help desk at myschool.org, and then uh, you can have it send a canned response. And so that way, anytime somebody sends an email, they will automatically get a reply as soon as, the, as soon as that email arrives in your inbox, which is great so that you can give people set expectations or you know that if maybe your email address given out to one group of people is one thing and it's different to another, you can, again, set those canned responses to be different. Um, I've also heard of some people who use canned responses as their signatures because they don't um, Gmail only allows you to have one signature, so they just easily have a couple other signatures in their canned response they can easily insert. That's actually a really good idea. I hadn't thought of that, and that could be very useful. So I'm going to file that one away for me. Uh, let me move down my list of some other labs that I, that I really want to make sure you hear about before we get to the end of this. Uh, one of them is undo send. Uh, if I say send an email, and if again you turn it on in that setting, and I send it to Dana to test of undo send. I click send. See how I have my message has been sent undo. You get a short window, maybe about 10 seconds, that you can, that you can undo a message. And let me tell you, those 10 seconds are 10 of the most valuable seconds you will ever have in your work life. I, you, the number of times that you uh, not just reconsider whether you're making a good choice in sending the email in the first place, but you notice that typo in the way that you spelled the person's name or that you missed some punctuation or that you uh, misspelled a word. It always seems to happen in that first 10 seconds. Turning on undo send will give you that moment of saying, you know, I think I better fix that before it goes out. So try undo send. The other one, especially since we're talking about Gmail uh, Jedi tricks, is smart labels. Turning on smart labels tells your, your priority inbox to get even smarter. It says, start noticing which things are bulk items. And to really get that experience, I'll go into my personal email account. Uh, and I'm going to go into my bulk folder. And you're going to see that it's all kinds of notifications from daily, uh, daily deal sites and Amazon and Marriott. And these things, uh, these things are automatically taken to the bulk folder. In that same way that you can set up a filter, this is smart. It figures out which items are bulk. It figures out which items are notifications. And it automatically moves them to the relevant labels for you. So another favorite lab, consider smart labels. Uh, I'm going to give a plug for Dana's favorite, which is send and archive. Again, archiving is the key to getting to inbox zero, and you can turn it on in such a way. I'm going to show you an, a, a standard Gmail situation has a, uh, a send button up here that you click when you're done with the, uh, with the email, or if I were replying to an email. You get that send button both at the top and bottom. If I'm in one where the lab is turned on, oh, I need to actually get into a reply email situation. Click reply. There's now a send and archive feature. Send and archive will send the email to the person and skip the choice where you say, hey, I would really like to have this, uh, this email remain in my inbox. Send and archive, it's one less click. Every fewer click that you have saves you time that you can click somewhere else, and you build up that time, and that's how you become that, G, uh, that, that Gmail Jedi, that very proficient user of this program that's designed to help you manage your work. 
Uh, another good one is at Ground Send. Uh, it's, again, I, the, the, the little places that you can save time. It allows you to click Send on an email, and it takes you immediately back to your inbox and it continues to process the email. So say that you had uploaded a large attachment to the email, clicked send, usually you would have to wait for the full attachment to be uploaded before you could start working on your next email. If you enable background send, then you can continue working while that gets processed in the background. Those are uh, five of uh, my favorite labs. I'm curious to see if anybody else has any, including Dana, that they want want me to discuss in this group in the remaining time that we have. Oh, let's see. Some other of my favorite labs. There's another one in there, um, another lab in there that's search docs and sites, and it, like, searches docs and everything from your Gmail search box. Um, and so that's, that's really handy. So when you're doing a search for, you know, a topic that you might have emailed or it might be a doc in your docs list or maybe it's a site, it's a it's a great great place to kind of get to those really quickly. Um, another neat thing is you can just search for the lab right at the top, which is I find very useful because there's so many labs out there. So I think if you just search for docs, oh that's what it's called. It's called Ask Search, um, and the Google Docs preview is actually a pretty neat one too. You can get show a little preview if somebody sends you even just a link to a doc. It's not necessarily the invite. You can see a preview of it. That's that's helpful. Uh, let's see. I also like um uh, previews. Oh no, that was graduated. Yeah, that was graduated. Um another neat thing that you can do in the sidebar is you can move labels that you don't necessarily want to see all the time and you can drag them down to where it says more. So on the left hand sidebar, let's say that Corey doesn't want to always see deleted items. Corey, if you just want to click and drag your deleted items label and put it under that more section. And then it kind of doesn't show up in that default view anymore. But if you click more, you can. So I've got some where those, there are some labels that I have just for kind of housekeeping, and I don't really need to keep them, um, you know, visible all the time. So I like to do do that as well. That was actually yeah. one that I didn't talk about in labels that I do that I highly recommend. I keep a label called archive label and say that this project is done. I can click on this label and edit it. I still want to have access to this label, but I don't want it to clutter up my long list of labels. I just go ahead and nest it under archive labels, and that's where my old project labels live, under one label, so that I can keep a nice, clean, these are the emails, the projects that I'm most currently working on. That's, that's a really good idea. I like that idea, um, kind of keeping, keeping all your emails uh, bunched together and bucketed and collected and things. Um, one other neat little thing, if you click on that web clips section next to labs at the very top. Uh, so um, I, I don't know if you added these, but web clips are kind of like the little ads that you can see. Uh, but you can actually customize them to have some of the, the feeds that you actually like to read. So um, you can actually add different RSS feeds, and it will pull those into the top of your inbox with little pieces of news and things, and occasionally I, you know, will see it, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that that was something that was going on today, and so you can add and remove different web clips. Um, oh, it says, due to low usage, we remove customization. <laughs> oh, wouldn't you know, right, when I was talking about it? Oh, yeah, I, I will attest that it was there not long ago, uh, but uh, I do recommend Google Reader as well. Uh, I do also, that's probably my second most used uh, Google Google experience out of out of Gmail is getting into your Google Reader to manage those feeds. So, yes, um, I did not actually select these uh, particular feeds. All right, great. And I, I know somebody was asking a question about some of the other webinars. Um, apologies on that. We're a little bit delayed in converting them into the YouTube format. We do have them available in the WebEx format, but it's not uh, not as easy to, to watch and to download some other software and things like that. So if you attended any of the previous webinars, you will be receiving a link to those and a link to this webinar and Corey's uh, helpful outline as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, this was a really uh, great and insightful webinar. So thank you, Corey. Uh, thank you, Dana. I enjoyed getting to uh, share this with everyone.